Now, let me introduce the speaker of the day. Welcome, Ms. Anika Mohan. She is working as Assistant Professor at College of Climate Change and Environmental Science under Kerala Agriculture University. Today, she will be talking to us about species distribution modeling of marine organisms. So, welcome again, Ms. Anika, and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you are all doing well and are vaccinated. Okay, uh, let me share my presentation. Hope my slides are visible. Okay. Yes, it is visible. Okay. You. you can make it. Uh, yes, now it is. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, then uh, let's talk about uh, species distribution modeling, especially for some marine organisms. Uh, and the major contents of this presentation will be I will just introduce the species distribution modeling to you. And uh, we'll talk about some applications and uh, certain terms and concepts. Uh, I will just briefly introduce the modeling framework uh, with few examples. And uh, before starting the talk, uh, I wonder, did you, uh, did you ever wonder why a species is just found only where it is? Uh, I think we are all familiar with this school of fishes. Uh, this is the Sardinella longiceps, our Indian oil sardine, uh, which is only this, which has a native habitat, we you know that, right? Uh, but this species is only visible in this native range of, uh, of this uh, fully collected connected ocean. Did you ever think about that? Similarly, there was various uh, species. The first one is uh, Chagos brain coral. This is a species of brain coral, which is only found in the Chagos Islands. And the second one is a Maldives anemone fish, which is only found in the Maldives Islands. And uh, the third is very common, uh, Etropla suretensis. And uh, this one is a frigate bird. This is a Christmas Islands, Island frigate bird. Actually, this bird roams around the world, but only breeds in, a, in the Christmas island of Indian Ocean. Uh, we all know that in the Indian Ocean itself has a lot of islands like uh, Lakshadweep, uh, maybe Netrani and Andaman and Nicobar, but it uh, breeds only in Christmas Island. Why? And uh, this is another species that is uh, a two-winged uh, flying fish that is uh, endemic to an uh, Atlantic waters. Uh, yeah, we know that uh, there is certain climatic or uh, environmental condition that is suitable for each uh, animals. That's why it is only flourished in a particular habitat, right? Okay, uh, how will we identify what are the factors that is suitable for a single uh, species? Or uh, how will we identify why, uh, what are the other uh, areas that, is, that might be suitable for this kind of species? Okay, for example, we will just look into a uh, Brazilian nut. Uh, this is only found in the Amazon forest. Here we can see the green spots. Uh, these green spots here is the occurrence points of uh, Brazilian nut uh, that is uh, distributed in the Amazon forest. Here, uh, look at the climatic variables. The red figure is an mean annual temperature and the other one is the annual precipitation. Uh, here we can clearly say that uh, the Brazil net is only distributed in a temperature higher than 20 or 25 to 30, right? So that the temperature range of Brazilian net is 25 to 30. Uh, shall we say that? Yeah, maybe. And uh, in the case of uh, rainfall, uh, the Brazilian net is only uh, distributed in the areas having higher uh, rainfall. That is uh, more than uh, more than about. Uh, 2000 mm, uh, right? Uh, do you find any correlation between these points and these uh, climatic variables? Yeah, we can do that. We can correlate the climatic variables and uh, the occurrence points to find out what are the factors that limiting the distribution of a single species and how these uh, climatic variables and the species is related. Uh, what we are doing during, uh, during the modeling process is, actually we have two spaces. The first one is a geographic space, and the uh, another one is an environmental space. Uh, actually, the geographic uh, space include what we see. That is, uh, we will collect the environmental variables or climatic variables of our species of interest uh, through the environment geographic space. 
that is uh, we will just collect uh, the raster rails or the raster data or gridded data of environmental uh, conditions uh, from a uh, open source source or uh, we will just uh, report it under uh, the concept of geographic trace because here we are looking into the amazon forest so we will extract the data from amazon forest in each of these layers there may be grids or pixels which containing a numerical value and in the case of occurrence data we also collect the data from the amazon forest or south america then we have the longitude and latitude values of uh, south america with us these are all values numerical values what we will do is we will uh, project these uh, numerical values into an environmental space or a multi dimensional space that is like uh, this here uh, in the case of a marine organism we can say the sea surface temperature sea surface salinity maybe current or uh, uh, productivity whatever it is uh, we will we will uh, take each axis as each variables uh, from each layer each each environmental layer we will get a range of values right uh, we will project that uh, we will use that environmental values to make the axis of a multi dimensional space and this black points here is the longitudes and latitude values of uh, our area of interest and the areas that is uh, green here is our occurrence or our suitable domain so uh, occurrence domain using this uh, we will uh, fit an algorithm to uh, identify the other thing the other habitats that containing this set of rules or this set of conditions there are various model algorithms out there uh, for example gap max and glm gam uh, don't worry about this now because we will discuss it later in a uh, little deep and after that we will just calibrate our model just like a simple instrument that we are calib calibrating before using we will calibrate our model by parameter setting and then we will get the uh, habitat suitability maps uh, please note that that the uh, the map or that the map that we see is also in the geographic space right uh, we will get the suitability map in our domain or in our area of interest and uh, from this suitability map we will extract the potential distribution of our species of interest and uh, so what are a species models actually it's a set of tools that uh, characterize the environmental conditions of course in a geographical domain and that are suitable for the species and then identifies where suitable environments are distributed in space and uh, we often see that uh, see that there are various names or various uh, terms referred to species distribution models like uh, ecological niche models niche models uh, predictive habitat models or uh, climate envelope model uh, so far and so on like uh, how we can distinguish uh, this ecological niche model and species distribution model actually the species distribution model is an umbrella term and all others comes under the species distribution model if you are looking into the relaxed niche of a uh, species then it will be an ecological niche model or a niche model and if you are just taking uh, where and where the have uh, suitable habitats or uh, what are the habitat that is that might be suitable for a species then it will be a uh, habitat suitability model and uh, if we uh, consider the future changes or future shift that a habitat then it will be a predictive distribution model so we will be extremely careful while selecting the or uh, selecting the name when we when it comes to a publication or a, a note or something and uh, species distribution models allow us to assess the suitability of a habitat for a species and the models these all these models are a raster based layers uh, such as our sea surface temperature salinity etc and uh, there are i already told you that there are various methods and uh, models or algorithms uh, basically there are three types of methods that is first one is profile techniques uh, in the profile techniques what we use is the, the environmental distance which is the simplest method and uh, less complicated method we here we just use the environmental distance to know the sites of occurrences uh, examples like goa matrix and uh, ecological niche factor analysis and the domain and biomapper are the softwares that we used to uh, used to find the uh, ecological environmental distance and uh, the next is uh, regression based techniques uh, there are two types of regression based techniques uh, 
uh, that are widely used uh, techniques that are generalized linear models and generalized additive models. Uh, in the case of generalized linear models, what we are doing is, uh, which is based on a relationship between uh, mean of the response variables and the linear composition of explanatory variables. Actually, uh, this is a multiple types of distributions can be used in this model and uh, uh, comparatively uh, GLM is a flexible model. And uh, the next is centralized additive model, uh, which is similar to GLM, but the difference is uh, it assumes a function are additive and components are smooth. Uh, it is a data-driven process and uh, can handle non-linear relationship as well. In the case of linear models, we can only assume the linear relationship or handle the linear relationship, but in the case of GIM, we can handle some uh, non-linear relationships as well. And the next is more advanced technique that is machine learning techniques. Uh, that is, uh, that work uh, just like uh, our brain, that is, uh, there will be various iterations to uh, learn the algorithm and uh, it work like our brain. Uh, there are two major types of uh, machine learning techniques. The first one is GAP, that is Dentic Algorithm for Rule Set Production, and the other is Maximum Entropy, that is Maxent. And uh, we will discuss more about Maxent in the coming slides. Uh, okay, before selecting our, our algorithm, we have to look into some features or some things. Uh, we know there are uh, many algorithms available, many types of data available, many approaches available. What will we do? What will I cho we choose? In that time, we will look into certain concepts. The first one is uh, the type of our occurrence data. Occurrence data are of different types. Uh, some may be present solely data. Some may be present absence or uh, presence background. Uh, how can we identify what type of data is ours? Uh, the first one is presence only data. Presence only data means we know the, the know the habitats which our species of interest is present. Uh, in such such cases, we will just uh, go for an env environmental envelope and uh, use the algorithms like bioclim maps and Euclid uh, distance. The thing is, we know our species of interest is present in this point, this point, this point, and this point, or all of this point. We have the occurrence data. Then we can do uh, use these algorithms. And if we have, we know where our species are present and absent. Absent. If uh, we if we know my uh, species is present here and absent here, then we have two sets of uh, longitudinal and longitudinal data. That is. Uh, presence as well as absence. Then we can go for GLM, GAM, MASO, uh, some uh, artificial intelligence approaches. Uh, and if we know uh, the presence point and uh, have no idea about uh, the absence, we can say, uh, my this is my presence point, I, or I know uh, my species of interest is present here, but I have no idea whether my species of interest is present or absent here. In such and such cases, we can use Maxent or GAP. That is, the Maxent users presents background data. The background data will be created itself by Maxent, or we uh, or either we can create a Max background layer for Maxent. And in the presence of uh, in the case of presence pseudo absence, the GAP itself will create some uh, pseudo absence. We just want to give some number of points. How many absence points uh, did I want only? Before uh, selecting the algorithm, we should be careful about this, our model type and or our occurrence data type. And uh, uh, how can we say which model is uh, better or uh, which one should I choose? Actually, it depends on uh, the occurrence data type. That is, uh, which data type uh, we have that uh, we discussed in the previous slide. Similarly, your species, that is, uh, some species might be rare and some might be common, right? Uh, if uh, if my species is rare, I only have a uh, minimum points, minimum data points. Then the best model to do is maximum entropy or Maxent models, right? Because Maxent is the model who can process with the minimum amount of uh, data. But uh, some other algorithms need a much an em enormous amount of uh, occurrence points so that it will work better. Uh, with a minimum amount of um, amount of uh, data, the model will work, but the result uh, would not be that much um, reliable. And uh, the next is our calibration, but that is how you tune the parameters. 
or how we how we will uh, what are the parameters that we are going to use what is its type or its uh, category uh, like that and our calibration process uh, even though there is no silver bullets in uh, selecting a model we can say this might work good or uh, according to uh, as my data type is this and uh, my calibration is this i can go for this model that's okay but there is no silver bullet or a one line rule for selecting our an algorithm for a species of interest we have to work or we have to research before selecting the algorithm for our species of interest in a particular location or a geographic space even uh, okay then why we model a species distribution for the use yeah maybe to understand the relationship between the species and its biotic and environment uh, biotic and abiotic environment and also to predict the occurrence of a species for location where the sow is lacking that is there is uh, many unexplored or many unexplored habitats or inaccessible habitat habitats in such cases a sow is not possible then we can predict the occurrence of species or predict the habitat suitability of a species so that we can conserve the habitat or conserve the area and the major applications of scms are or major practical uses are uh, in in uh, planning a reserve design or a conservation planning and in the case of uh, environmental impact assessment which, which is a hot topic i think i saw that a couple of papers uh, published recently in this domain and uh, land and natural resource management ecological res restoration this is also an important uh, use and uh, risk and impact of invasive species this in the case of marine uh, ecosystem the risk and impact of invasive species or the shift of uh, habitats is also important and uh, the effect of climate change on biodiversity this uh, maybe this is the hottest topic um, and there is some terms and concepts uh, behind hdms um, first first one is what's the niche actually there is a lot of uh, definitions out there for the niche uh, we will um, go from in a chronology go in a chronological order uh, in 2000 uh, greenel and scientists called greenel described niche as a sub subset of environmental conditions under which populations of a species have positive growth rates uh, according to greenel uh, the greenerial niche uh, is the environment uh, is the space or the habitat that is uh, environmentally suitable for a species or it's a subset of environmental conditions later in the uh, 2003 ectonian uh, niche describes uh, niche as a requirement of resources and interactions that permit positive growth rate of population to the its impact here we uh, see the biotic interactions or the ecological concepts of uh, niche and uh, later the hutchinsonian niche or hutchinsonian introduced certain terms and uh, he said that the term niche is defined as a sum of all environmental factors acting on an organism the niche thus defined is a region in uh, of an n dimensional hyperspace and uh, hutchinsonian also put forward uh, two types of variables uh, that is binomic variables uh, or linked variables or direct variables uh, often referred to as uh, biotic variables and uh, the next is xenopoietic variables that is non linked variables or uh, environmental or biotic variables uh, and the uh, widely accepted definition of uh, niche is ecological niche is a term of position of a species within an ecosystem describing both the range of conditions necessary for persistence that is uh, abiotic factors of the species and its ecological role in the ecosystem that is the biotic factor biotic factors uh, factors uh, actually the distribution of a species also determined by the factors uh, is also a scale de dependent thing uh, sometimes we will just look after a global scale and sometimes it's, it's in the local scale then we will be uh, cautious about this thing that is uh, the species distribution model is uh, sometimes a scale dependent thing that is if we are just uh, Uh, learning or uh, looking into the global or continental or uh, region regional uh, domain then uh, we don't have to look into the biotic interaction or maybe it is not that much feasible to look into the each and every biotic interaction in such 
in such and such cases, uh, the climatic factors and uh, bathymetric features is fine. And if we are uh, going to do a uh, scale or a local scale, then we will just have to look into the biotic interactions and all the factors, all available factors, and even the barriers uh, and uh, all possible environmental predictors. And uh, the according to Hutchinsonian, the synopertic variables, that is non-linked variables like a uh, uh, see surface temperature, salinity, bathymetry, all are uh, measured at a broad spatial scales uh, because uh, it's all the abiotic factors and the niche that we are uh, describing there or defining there is a Lagrinarian niche. And uh, in the case of bino binomial variables, it will be linked variables or biotic variables. Uh, yeah, it should, we will account this uh, while we selecting a micro scale or a local scale. That will be an ectonian niche. And uh, there is an, another uh, important concept, I'm not going to deep into this, that is the AM diagram, that is our BAM diagram. Uh, there is a space that is uh, abiotic or a suitable abiotic conditions, A, and uh, B, that is uh, suitable biotic conditions. There will be an area of intersection between A and B, that will be GI. And uh, the third uh, domain is uh, movement or accessibility of, the, of our species of interest. And uh, the uh, intersection between A and M can be uh, referred to as GA. And the intersection point of A, B, A, and M will be GO. Uh, what is GA? Uh, GA is area that containing a particularly suitable condition required for a species survival and growth. And uh, GP, that is uh, potential distribution, which is the sum of GO and GI. GO we already uh, saw that is the point of intersection. And uh, GO is the area that contains both abiotically and biotically suitable conditions and are accessible for the species. That is, the M uh, domain is also there. That's why it is accessible for the few species. And GI is an invertible um, area that is uh, in both abiotically and biotically suitable conditions, but are inaccessible for the uh, species. While we are uh, considering a species for uh, doing a species distribution model, we should be aware of these concepts. And uh, while moving to the uh, modeling framework, uh, I'm showing this here because I'm, I took this paper as an example here. Uh, don't worry about this complex diagram because uh, what we are going to do in a model or a, in an algorithm is, we, uh, first we have to collect the data, the occurrence points. Uh, I collected or we collected the occurrence points from GBIF. It is an open source software, open source uh, website or domain that uh, gives you um, occurrence points of almost all species and uh, um, the, the data set, the environmental data sets were downloaded from NASA, JEPCO, APDRC and Ocean Color Webs. It's all our uh, open source and uh, the uh, occurrence data that we collected from GBAF is cleaned and uh, processed in ArcGIS and uh, we just added some uh, non-distribution points from literatures and uh, we did some random validation of GBS data. The GBS data is highly uh, reliable. Why? Because they will give all details about each and every point they have in their domain uh, through their metadata. So uh, it's really uh, reliable data. And uh, we just yeah. did some sampling bias, uh, remove the sampling bias because uh, Always there will be some bias, some human bias or some instrumental bias. There will be some bias. We have to be uh, extremely careful with the bias while doing SDM. And we removed the sampling bias to, uh, do, uh, using a process called spatial thinning. And uh, we extracted the various environmental variables and we just resampled the ra uh, rasters, to a, rasters to a uniform resolution because uh, that's a mandatory step. We have uniform resolution and even uniform cell size or all the, uh, all the, our uh, environmental layers will be similar. And uh, then we just uh, have to check the autocorrelation in, uh, in between the uh, variables we selected because we, we will be extremely careful while selecting the environmental predictors because the predictors that uh, we selected should represent our uh, species but not over-represent or um, auto-correlate. That's why we have to eliminate the variables which having a uh, high auto-correlation between them and uh, then uh, uh, change, the, uh, change the format of all the layers into ASCII 
and uh, then create a member, uh, bias layer. We created a bias layer here for a uh, for getting a better model. We can also avoid this step and uh, the Maxent itself create a uh, background layer for us. Uh, in order to create the background layer, we use the GBIF data or occurrence data that we uh, processed and the uh, ASCII files of uh, environmental data. And using this, all these processes were done in our studio and uh, all these uh, layers along with this layer, like our occurrence layer, our bias layer, and uh, the ASCII layers uh, should go for modeling. And uh, we just examine the uh, model by model evaluating using our studio and finalize the model algorithm or model setting. Then we will just apply the machine learning algorithm for our data and created a resultant uh, map. This is a this is a map for Acropora muricata and uh, Porites lutea. Porites lutea both are coral reefs or uh, coral species, uh, which is found. And uh, the area that we considered are uh, Lakshadweep, Maldives, Chagos Archipelago. Uh, which is in the Indian Ocean, and uh, this fi this final map is processed, and uh, I will show it in a later slides. This is the basic concept of uh, or basic uh, model, basic for framework modeling framework, and uh, there is an another uh, thing that we can do. Uh, as I already said, there is no silver bullet in selecting an algorithm, but we can do some ensemble model. That is, uh, ensemble model is nothing but we will just combine uh, many algorithms or all possible algorithms together, uh, like uh, Max and GLM, GAM, all together to form a resultant or combined map. This will be uh, more effective sometimes. It's also dependent on our species uh, data, data availability and all. Uh, and uh, uh, this the ensemble model will be the best one, but that doesn't mean uh, ensemble model will be a burst over uh, individual model all the times. Sometimes the individual models will work better. Uh, sometimes ensemble model will be better. We have to be extremely careful while selecting our algorithm and uh, doing the model. And also the uh, in the case of uh, species distribution model, we should uh, we should interpret our result or our final map as a hypothesis. We have to check it or validate it to ensure the uh, to ensure that uh, this is the habitat that uh, is uh, residing. And the SDM do identify areas with uh, environmental condition similar to where the species occurs, but do not identify where a species is actually found. This is what I said, you should uh, careful with our result and should treat our result as the hypothesis we have to validate our result and uh, let's uh, see some software that is uh, used for r and uh, this is an uh, r domain r studio uh, using r we can do uh, different types of sdm first one there is some packages for sdm in r the like ssdm uh, using ssdm packages we can do some user friendly or a uh, uh, SDM without the ports. Similarly, there is a standalone package that is Wallace. This one. Uh, using this also, we can. This is this all are uh, some GUI graph, graphical user interfaces. So we can do some uh, user friendly uh, modeling. And also using R, we can create our model algorithm and we can do uh, species distribution modeling using ports. And uh, there is an, another package that is Biomod, uh, which is updated to Biomod 2. Biomo2 is also an, uh, an excellent package that is uh, by using codes, we can uh, do the modeling and uh, there is possibility to do the ensemble model in uh, that package itself. And the next is MaxSense. In order to work in MaxSense, we should have some other uh, softwares like uh, maybe some uh, GIS analysis software like RGS or QGS or the RStudio. Uh, the maxent is a ma maximum entropy principle which predicts the potential distribution of a species by using the uh, artificial intelligence, not artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, principle, and uh, uh, which uh, measure the randomness or the entropy of uh, data and uh, maximize the randomness by removing patterns. And uh, it works with presence point, or means presence only points. This is also a widely widely uh, using software for SPMs. And uh, this is an example that uh, um, 
that I already mentioned before during the methods or a framework. Uh, actually, Lakshadweep uh, Maldives Tagos Archipelago is one of the largest chains of atoll system in the world. Uh, but due to its remote sense, uh, remoteness, it is not uh, that much accessible. All the islands are not much accessible. Uh, and there is uh, various sea mounts and small islands here and there in the uh, in this archipelago. Uh, to understand and manage the sensitive ecosystem, uh, we should be uh, we should have some knowledge about the existing coral cover. Uh, so in this study, the habitat modeling of Acropora muricata and Poritas studia both their corals uh, were carried out using the maximum entropy algorithm uh, to predict the probability of occurrence using uh, the environmental predictors and uh, it is found that the bathymetry is the variable that having the highest contribution uh, followed by calcite and phosphate and uh, the result of this uh, study uh, actually throw a light on the probable occurrence of uh, coral reefs in, in many unexplored or unknown areas uh, like uh, certain submerged banks here or sea mounts here and the uh, islands like coral the Bessastri Petro or uh, um, cetrosis bank, etc. And uh, serious explored uh, and have a strategic uh, potential to uh, for an ecosystem connectivity of this region and uh, the relationship between coral distribution and the environment variables as predictor uh, by this study will be valuable uh, in the case of uh, some future conservation activities or designing some uh, marine protected area so uh, something this is the process to map the the blue map that we saw in the uh, methods is process to get this one and uh, we just added the uh, legends and uh, map in the background and this is another paper uh, that is uh, modeled the spatial distribution of nematelos and assets that uh, in of the northern indian ocean in a changing climate uh, actually, we included the uh, climate parameter here, that is, we added the RCP scenarios. Actually, we checked the shift of uh, this species uh, in RCP 6 and RCP 8.5. Actually, the shift of species distribution uh, towards the northern latitude are evident in many seas. So, the northern Indian Ocean is also warming. So, uh, the increased rate of warming in the distribution of pelagic fish species. So many fish species in this family, that is uh, Lupidae, uh, also a, a vulnerable species. Uh, the Nematelosa is one of the most important pelagic fish out here. And uh, this study is tried to understand uh, the distributional shifts of the species from uh, region in two climate uh, scenarios, that is uh, RCP6 and RCP8.5 in two time periods, that is uh, 2000, 40, 50, and 9100, and the result indicate a higher influence of uh, current. The most influencing variables uh, we got here is current, vector, and the mean temperature, uh, and the distribution, uh, the northward shift of the distribution range is observed in both future scenarios as compared to the uh, predicted current distribution. This is current distribution, and this is the future shift. Uh, sorry, I made a mistake that uh, the figure number C is here. Then A, B, C, D, and T. Sorry. Okay. Mm, then there will be some uh, limitations in STMs. We should be we should be extremely careful while uh, selecting the data, that is, uh, the point locations as well as the predictor variables. Why the why because the suitability of uh, our species should be a function of our predictor variables and point. Locations. So uh, all sampling data will be incomplete and potentially biased. That is, there will be uh, some accessibility problems, some human errors or human bias or uh, uh, some instrumental bias. So we'll be extremely careful with the point location as well as the predictor variable must, must be capable of uh, describing our species. Uh, there are two as aspects there. First thing is our predicted variables or the variables that we choose should indicate the or uh, should represent the uh, habitat or uh, species uh, flourishment, or uh, it should not be over correlated, or it should not. There, there should be thousands of variables that influencing our species, uh, but only ten may be the uh, most important ones, or the uh, or the one who can have a command on our species uh, distribution. So we will be extremely careful 
while selecting the predictor variables. And uh, the most important thing is we should uh, treat our result as a hypothesis and we should check or we should validate our data before saying uh, my species or the species that I uh, I modeled is uh, will be there in these and these areas that might be there that might be there in this uh, and these areas because that uh, habitats will be environmentally suitable for that uh, species and uh, these are the key points uh, esteem characterizes a species suitable environmental condition and identify places where those conditions are and uh, it's a, a relatively recent and first developing framework. Uh, so there was a lot of jargons and concepts. We will be extremely careful while dealing with this. And uh, there will be a lot and lot of outputs that we will get, uh, like uh, various maps, response curves, and uh, jackknife. So we will be extremely careful while interpreting uh, those. And in the case of Max, and we will get uh, the uh, get the details about which variable is more uh, important or which variables having the most contribution, uh, but uh, we will be extremely careful. The contribution may be positive or negative. The model tell us this is the most contributing variable only. We have to find out whether it's a positive co uh, contribution or uh, it will enhance the uh, suitability or uh, vice versa. It is important to differentiate and establish the relationship between geographical space and environmental space. And uh, the both abiotic and biotic factors determine the distribution of a species and are scale dependent. Uh, and the model, the actual distribution or the realized niche, both abiotic and biotic factors are required as well as barriers of movement. And uh, sorry. And there are many modeling approaches and algorithms. And the recent day, silver bullet or the recent day, uh, perfect or best algorithm. Um, and uh, these are the books that I uh, refer and the main concepts and terms uh, that I discuss here is from these books and the ecological niches and geographic distribution is the first of this kind book that explaining the background processes of uh, species distribution and uh, all these books are awesome for learning the uh, species distribution and this is a recent book uh, that is good for applications, uh, learning the applications of spacious uh, distribution models. And uh, okay, that's it for today. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, any questions? Yeah. Hope to understand uh, is some concepts. Thanks, Anika for delivering an excellent talk and thanks to all who joined today for the talk. Before we go to discussion or leave the party, please provide us with feedbacks about today's talk. The link to fill the feedback form is provided in the chat box. Uh, we are always looking to expand our coordinator network. So if you help us to circulate our talks, we would like to hear from you. Just send us an email to afstalks.gmail.com. Now let us move into the discussion part. We have 15 minutes for the discussion. Please use the hand raise feature if you have a question to the speaker and you will be given a chance to speak. If possible, also type in your, uh, type your question in the chat box so everyone, including the speaker, can read and understand your question. So let us check. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Radha Krishnan has messaged in the chat box. He would like to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan, please ask your question directly to Dr. Anika. Good evening, Ananga, ma'am. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, uh, yeah. Happy to, to hear your uh, wonderful uh, talk. In fact, uh, I'm very interested in this topic, species distribution. I'm now working in uh, Northeastern Himalayas, uh, fish distribution, and uh, starting from taxonomy onwards. Okay. In fact, I was also trying to do some modeling like HSI, IBI, uh, with the advice from uh, our uh, dear uh, Sajana ma'am. <laughs> ma'am may be knowing. So in fact, I, I have, uh, at the same time, I have a full agreement with you that environmental parameter has a greater role. Yeah. 
but having said that uh, what i feel that many of the models we, we generate so far is more skewed towards environmental modeling uh, biotic parameters have a very important role and to say food availability that is i feel that i feel even than uh, some of the environmental variables biotic uh, factors like as i said food availability and then species interactions predator prey interactions is very important why i am telling you that uh, i have tried to see the distribution of uh, snow trouts in northeastern himalayas and uh, when i was uh, developing this um, iba scores some of the locations are very good habitat suitable uh, like uh, scores uh, good oxygen available and uh, habitat conditions are very suitable of course they have distribution then when i was uh, going up further up where the environment is more suitable uh, i became surprised that i am not able to find any of the samples then i came down and i found that would be some more available at the downstream than upstream where the species is more available so but unfortunately what i use in gis based models but which is very many common uh, not only fish as you said for many organisms more skewed towards uh, climatic variables environmental variables for to say for aquatic organism it is oxygen and for or um, physical habitat variable but they are not taking into account how much food is available in a particular location the quantity of food availability then the critical parameters like what is the most important food available then the species predator prey if there is more predator available in a particular locality uh, small prey fishes will not uh, living there even the environment is so ambient for them so this i don't know how uh, it is very unfortunate that still these factors though we say that yes of course biotic factors also influ influence uh, it is not found uh, being taken into account that much so uh, i i want a suggestion or uh, what is your idea because uh, ma'am was working for a long time in this field Do, did you find such literature where um, biotic conditions are also given that much importance as uh, climatic variable please thank you ma'am okay thank you actually that's a nice question by because this is what i said we will be uh, extreme careful with the ban diagram because uh, we can do modeling uh, the first thing the uh, modeling is a scale dependent thing if we are go uh, going for a uh, global scale modeling there should be uh, limitations like uh, uh, we can't uh, account all the biological interactions of the availability of things into this kind of models and it's not possible but okay. if we are going to the local scale like uh, you said it's it's a uh, really need it's really a need that uh, we should do that uh, actually there is two types of sdms that is correlative sdms and mechanistic uh, sdm the correlating uh, sdms usually go for uh, the climatic parameters and the mechanistic sdms actually uh, deal with the biotic interactions as well actually the uh, fundamental niche or the realization niche of species is uh, completely dependent on biotic as well as abiotic uh, factors so with the uh, combined uh, use of both these factors only we can say this species will be there that's what i said we should uh, process or we should uh, take our result just as a hypothesis this species this uh, area is there area might be suitable or this area is uh, environmentally suitable which doesn't mean the species will be there there will be uh, predation prey or uh, some other food availability like you said or uh, various other factors maybe the presence of one species may hinder the uh, flourish, uh, flourishing of other so uh, what we can do is if you are doing a local scale modeling you can go for a mechanistic modeling that you can include the food things or uh, the uh, biotic interactions and all such things into the model and uh, do it it will be better always the mechanistic model will be better but it's not feasible in all conditions that's a thing and uh, uh, from uh, your question i understand that it's a local or a micro area right not in a global or a, uh, it's, it's not a global area. There, right no no right yeah, then it's, uh, right. better to go for a, then uh, then it's better to go for a mechanistic uh, approach 
and it's a little more complicated, but it's possible. And there is a lot of literature available on uh, web for that. Thank you. Okay, okay, ma'am. Thank you. What I feel okay. that. Uh, yes, of course, uh, we are dealing with um, the species distribution modeling. Uh, I think, of course, uh, distribution also, you may be taking into account the abundance of uh, species, right? The numbers, abundance in numbers may be also given weightage in these models. Uh, not weightage. Uh, certain algorithms will work only with a certain amount of data because uh, what we're doing is, while we're giving some occurrence points and environmental points, they will take the values in the environmental space and process it by training the model. To train the model, certain algorithms need a uh, definite amount of data. Uh, in the case of MaxSend, it will work with a, a smaller amount of data, but in some other models, it will and we will get the result uh, that you know be that much reliable. That's it. That doesn't mean uh, which is abundance dependent. If uh, if we are having only uh, very little points, we will select an appropriate. We should select an appropriate uh, algorithms. Otherwise, we will not get a reliable uh, outcome or a result. That's the thing. All hope right, you all. hope I clarified it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, this uh, migration is Thank also you. taken into account, this kind of modern, because many species used to migrate to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, if, if we are just uh, considering the uh, season, uh, maybe the seasonal migration will be there. And if we are considering the seasons, we should uh, take account into the... Uh, we will uh, look into the migration as well. If you are just uh, taking... Uh, not... Uh, Considering the seasonal variations, uh, I don't think how we can uh, consider the migration. It's even on our time scale. Okay. Uh, Thank we are you. Just one year, yeah. We can consider the season, right? And the migration will mostly in seasonal migration, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Maybe feeding, breeding migrations, mostly seasonal right now. Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Radhakrishnan. We have two more questions uh, from Arunaloshis. I think, uh, Arunaloshis, you can directly ask to Anada, Anaka, if you are here. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Thank you very much. I, I would appreciate Anaka for a best uh, presentation, although I'm new to these things. I'm not really a modeling person. Okay, my question is like, uh, what will be the difference or how accurate is uh, with the modeling uh, data with the actual data? And also, our aquatic environment is like a a changing one because our parameters, the temperature, the salinity keep changing. So how how would we adjust these things with the actual thing? So, yeah. Okay, okay. This is also a good question, I think. Uh, actually, uh, in the case of accuracy, uh, we can check it. If we are doing a mechanistic model with uh, considering all the factors that are influencing a habitat or a species, the accuracy will be much higher because uh, we, we are accounting the climatic or the environmental suitability, uh, suitability as well as the biotic suitability, the accuracy will be higher or uh, the species that we predicted will be there. Uh, but in the case, if we are just uh, looking the niche, then the uh, suitable niche will be there. We can't say the uh, uh, species will be there. That depends. Actually, which uh, method that we're using, that will depend on the accuracy on uh, the accuracy is dependent on what method we are choosing or what type of modeling we are doing. And in the second question, in a changing aquatic environment, uh, we have to change or not, right? Uh, actually, we can do some historical analysis or also also future predictions. If we know how the water parameters will change, we can do the predictive modeling here uh, now itself, like uh, the IPCC climate scenarios or uh, uh, the RCP scenarios or SSP scenarios. We can those scenarios to uh, predict how this species will shift or how this species will change according to the uh, changes in uh, parameters. That we okay. can. Yeah. yeah, so you worked on the Acropora and the Poritis species, right? So how was that like? Because being a coral, being a sedentary organism, not like other marine organisms keep changing or uh, migrating. So how was that accuracy or how was that result? 
uh, actually in the case of corals the thing uh, the uh, situation is different because a coral is a sessile organism so yes sedentary uh, yeah yes. sedentary so, yes. so uh, there is no scope for migration so yes. uh, what it did to us i just uh, modeled in the uh, modeled the uh, distribution of uh, the coral species in indian ocean and what i found is that will get extinct why because by the, when the uh, the surface temperature and uh, etc will change us there will be northward shift but in our cases or in the case of uh, indian ocean there is no space for movement because uh, the indian ocean is land law with this condition okay and, okay yeah so uh, about the accuracy we can do the validation all right all actually right. the actually uh, points and islands with that uh, in in such cases i can say my model is uh, about uh, 90% accurate all right okay can i ask one more one more question is like you in your paper you you talked about the acropora and the porite species is that the only major corals found there or uh, you um, uh, eliminated or didn't give importance to other other groups or other species actually uh, actually that work was a part of my thesis and uh, what it is did was i just selected six different species from different genera and uh, modeled the uh, modeled the habitat suitability for my thesis and uh, what i did was acropora and porites were the major uh, two of major genuses there so i selected two corals and the most abundant coral, uh, species from that groups and just modeled to find out how it will change that's it uh, i didn't ignore the other ones but i just did this so you finalized on the the major species that were uh, that were occurring in the area yeah actually the major uh, genuses and find out the common species in that from that all right all right okay okay thank you very much anna thank you thank you thank you thank you adi uh, uh, we have a question from deep Uh, he has asked the question is how do we identify areas of conservative importance for threatened species when spms could potentially only identify suitability of the species presence and not the actual species present what we can do to improve the predictability of species occurrence using sdms beyond habitat suitability in, in such cases uh in the case of conservative importance we have to find out what are the potential habitats uh, that's one uh, aspect that is uh, if a habitat is uh, potential or is any possibility for connectivity or something like that we have to consider uh, that whole area in order for that we have to find out uh, the suitability of that area and uh, in the case of actual presence we have to uh, take care of the biotic and abiotic factors and we have to find out uh, this thing and the other aspects using the species distribution model we can easily find out the uh, potential areas or uh, areas that might be the uh, species is present so that we can directly uh, validate the data there and find out whether the species is find there or not we don't have to uh, survey the entire area to uh, conserve the, uh, that a particular habitat using this predictions we can find out a, a particular area or a domain to do the survey or validation so that uh, we can ease the conservation planning and uh, i think there was one more question at the end what what oh, we yeah. improve the practice yes, the, uh, the question is from pradesh pradesh uh, can you ask it directly to anaga before that i think deepak has a question uh, i saw deepak have uh... yeah yeah he, uh, he she answered that question. she answered that okay uh, so uh, my question is like you know mostly for the um, the spat distribution of uh, shellfish um, is there anything different that you have to look at for the modeling of that those kinds of distribution or have you have you seen any peculiar or anything different than the fin fish pre, uh, distribution that you have to look at actually uh, actually i'm not uh, that much into this topic but uh, uh, what we can do is we can uh, create our own data sets and do a, a more reliable mechanistic model we can, that we can uh, just identify all the factors that affecting the or limiting the 
species distribution and uh, model it to find out uh, where the suitability is there and or how these uh, species will change in the future scenarios. Okay. I think you got uh, Okay. Yeah, it, it clarifies, but it, you know, I, I I probably will contact you for more for like a more in yeah, sure, sure, sure. I can give specific details uh, about what what I'm asking, and then and then we can go from there. Thank you, though. Thank you, thank you, Pradesh. Uh, Anika, can you share your contact email or something in the chat box, so all can those who can contact you in this later also for clarifying yeah. their doubts. Uh, a personal mail ID, then you uh, can contact. Okay, thank you, Anika, for sharing your contact. I have uh, some questions. Uh, you explained that species uh, distribution, uh, that algorithms using R and also using Maxent. Whether Maxent is also a freeware like R, like whether we have to buy, purchase it or whether it is freely available. No, 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 Maxent is also freely available. It's available. Okay, okay. And also, you explained that we can use this uh, SDMs for assessing the risks of invasive species. So before introducing any species, can we use uh, how invasive it will be? Whether we can do this also using yeah. this max and yeah. or whatever yeah. algorithm. You see. Yes, yes. Because so, uh, what, so what kind of input data will be needed in that? This Because that species is not available here in our country. We are introducing it uh, for aquaculture or some other purpose. So can we do uh, assess the poten uh, potential risk using this one? Actually, the idea behind this is uh, we know where it is flourished in the other, its native habitat. We know the uh, parameters out there. So we can compare the uh, areas that we are going to introduce using these parameters and find out where this, uh, this species or this uh, area is most suitable for this or uh, is there a chance to get exploited? That uh, particular species. Oh, so we are comparing their native habitat uh, parameters with our yes, yes. Uh, yes, our yes. geographic uh, environmental parameters. Also, oh, we can do this with the same uh, max and all. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We can use the max and for this. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anaga, for clearing my doubts. Uh, okay. I just check whether we have any more questions in the chat box. Uh, oh, yes, there is one more question from Mohammed Nisin. Uh, Nisin, can you ask it directly to Anika? Ah uh, yes. Uh, so it was a wonderful presentation, first of all. Uh, so my question is, uh, what is the difference between true absence and pseudo absence? Uh, I mean, like uh, when we consider the distribution of a species, if a particular point is taken as a presence point, all the rest where that particular species is not found is potentially an absence point. But how, out of that, how will we actually identify the true absence points while we start doing the models? Actually, uh, actually we, can, uh, we can say the environment is truly unsuitable for a species. If we say this, this environmental parameters, or uh, there is a set of environmental parameters and uh, these uh, parameters forms a habitat. And uh, if we can say, this uh, habitat is truly unsuitable for a, uh, for the our species of interest. Then we can say it's a true absence. We can uh, thoroughly say that this is this species is not uh, suitable for this particular point or lat launch. Then we can say that's a, a true absence. Or uh, in the in the other case, if the species is was species was absent there for a long or uh, we never found that particular species in that area. So we can say the species is absent there, though it, it might be a absence point. Uh, that doesn't mean it will be a true absence. And uh, in the case of pseudo absence, pseudo absence is a different thing. That is, uh, we assuming that uh, the species is not there and or we know that the species is not there, uh, not there. So we are just uh, taking that point of pseudo absence. Actually, we can take a uh, true absence point uh, background point as well as a pseudo absence points. True absence point should be a true absence. There should not be, or that the area should be unsuitable for uh, the species of interest. Hope, uh, so hope like uh, once we do uh, species distribution modeling and after that, when, when we identify the suitable habitats, we go and survey and we identify that that particular species is not there in that area. 
we can call that as true absence, right? No, no, because uh, there may be other, that point may be uh, environmentally suitable, but uh, that uh, species may not, might not be there. That may be because of some uh, competition or predation or some other things. If we are just uh, doing a mechanistic model after considering all the factors uh, that can be uh, a limiting factor for the species, then the uh, then also the uh, point is not suitable. Then we can say that might be a true absence. But still, it is environmentally suitable, so we can we can say it's a true. Yeah. We have okay. to uh, find it is. Uh, environmentally unsuitable. Then only we can say it uh, true absence. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nisim, for the wonderful question. And uh, there is uh, no more questions from the chat box. Uh, there is a suggestion to the organizers by Dr. Dada Krishnan to come up with a book volume. Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> we will be thinking of it. Uh, I just request the audience whether they have used the hand raised feature. If you have any more questions to ask, I hope only very, I think the questions, no more questions. Thank you, Anaga. Uh, it was a, uh, a wonderful talk and it was very interesting and you explained it in a very simple way. Thank you very much for this talk. I hope there is no question and we can wind up the session here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I request the uh, participant to give the feedback in the which link provided in the chat box. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, AFS Talks, for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you.